Cora TV. The world is thinking. Just for a quick overview, um, the book is narrated by a main uh, so, um, character Sefa Stefanos, who left Ethiopia during the revolution in the 1970s um, when the former emperor was overthrown by a communist regime. And um, he owns a small little grocery store in Washington, D.C. And um, it's him and two other African immigrants who are friends. And together, the three of them form this little trio of, of a family inside of the grocery store. And it's a neighborhood that's rapidly changing. And he himself is. Um, a little bit disconnected and alienated and alone, and and most of the story takes place inside of this really small little world inside of the store, and um, between him and his friends and um, a few other characters. So, um, I'm going to read just from the beginning, um, which takes place with him opening this or him closing the store one evening, actually. So, at eight o'clock, Joseph and Kenneth come into the store. They come almost every Tuesday. It's come a routine between among the three of us without our ever having acknowledged it as such. Sometimes only one of them comes, sometimes neither of them. No questions are asked because nothing is expected. 17 years ago, we were all new immigrants working as valets at the Capitol Hotel. According to the plaque outside the main entrance, the hotel was built to resemble the Medici's family house in Italy. On weekends, tourists lined the rooftop to stare at the snipers perched on the White House roof. It was there that Kenneth became Ken the Kenyan and Joseph, Joe from the Congo. I was skinnier then than I am now, and as our manager said, I didn't need a nickname to remind him I was Ethiopian. You closed the store early today, Kenneth asks, as he walks in and glances at the empty aisles. He comes straight from his job his suit coat still on despite the early May heat. His shirt is neatly pressed and his tie is firmly fastened around his neck. Kenneth is an engineer who tries not to look like one. He believes in the power of a well-tailored suit to command the attention and respect of those who might not otherwise give him a second thought. Every week he says the same thing when he walks in. He knows there is no humor in it, but he's come to believe that American men are successful because they say the same thing over and over again. <clears throat> Don't take it from me, he said in his defense once. Listen to them. Every day, the same thing. Every day my boss comes in and he says to me, you still fighting the good fight, Kenneth? And I put my fist in the air and say, still fighting. And he says, that's what I like to hear. He makes 90000 a year. 90,000. So I say, you close the store early today, and you say, fuck you. Fuck you, Ken, I say, as the door closes behind him. He smiles gratefully at me whenever I say that. As much as Kenneth has ever needed anything in his life, he has needed order and predictability. Small daily reassurances that the world is what it is, regardless of how flawed that may be. He has a small mouth with full lips that would be considered beautiful on a woman, but that on him come off as overly puckered. He's self-conscious about his teeth, which are slightly brown and bent in the same direction. Joseph pressed him once into saying why, even now, with all that he earns, he has never had them fixed. Kenneth smiled a full, wide smile for us before he responded. When he speaks in front of strangers, he buries his mouth behind his hand he rubs his lower lip between his thumb and forefinger, making everything he is embarrassed about disappear. You can never forget where you came from if you have teeth as ugly as these, he said. He grinned once more. He tapped a slightly brown front tooth for effect. Kenneth looks Kenyan. His skin is dark, his nose is long and thin, and yet his features are soft, almost delicate, like a child's. He's six feet tall, but it's only in the past two years since he got his job that he's ever weighed more than 150 pounds. When he's drunk, he likes to lift up his shirt, blow out his stomach, and pats his protruding belly proudly. 
God bless America, he says with each pat. Only here can someone become the Buddha. I go to the back of the store and pull out the fold-up table and chairs the three of us always sit at. I have a small deli counter in the front, now empty, behind which used to lie wasted slabs of roast beef, ham, and turkey cut to look like the upper half of a cow's thigh just before it becomes the ass. I spent $2,000 of borrowed money on it with the idea that perhaps my store could become a deli, and in becoming a deli, a restaurant, and in becoming a restaurant, a place that I could sit back and look proudly upon. I place the chairs right in front of the empty deli counter. I sit with my back against the glass. It's May 2nd. Since January, I've had exactly three deli orders. Turkey, no mayo, wheat bread. Turkey, mustard, wheat bread. Turkey, just one slice. Not a single one after lunchtime. Despite my recent efforts, there's nothing special to my store. It's narrow, shabby, and brightly lit with a ceiling of fluorescent bulbs that hum for over an hour every morning after being turned on. I sell 25 cent bags of potato chips, two liter bottles of Pepsi, boxes of macaroni and cheese, diapers, soap, detergent, condensed milk, and narrow aisles haphazardly arranged. Jojo here yet, Kenneth asks. Some day it's Joe from the Congo, or Jojo Congo, or Congo Joe. Not yet, I tell him. Africans, Congolese, you can never trust us to be on time. You are. I'm an engineer, he says. I have to be precise. Precision is the name of my game. You say to be somewhere at 8.30, I'm there at 8.30. Not a minute later. He pulls out a bottle he pulls out a bottle of Johnny Walker Black from his bag and places it on the table. How is today, he asks me. $373.84. Kenneth shakes his head mournfully at the number. Almost nobody comes into the store anymore. It's been this way for months now, with each month a little worse than the one before. Business is slow, money is tight, and ever since Judith moved out of the neighborhood, I've been opening and closing my store at odd hours, driving away what few regular customers I still left. Recently, Kenneth tried to bring the subject up while we were alone in the store. He was looking at my accounts for April and shaking his head in dismay while tisking loudly to himself. There were ten days last month that were marked with a red zero, days that I hadn't even bothered to open the store or that I'd closed before any customers had a chance to come in. Why are you doing this, he finally asked me. He held open the book so I could see exactly what he was talking about. Do you even care? I shook my head, not knowing how to explain to him that there were no one-word answers or common phrases that I could turn to for an answer. On a good day, I have 40 or maybe 50 customers. Most of them are stay-at-home moms or dads who've moved into one of the newly refurbished homes around Logan Circle. They stop in during an afternoon stroll with their children dangling around their necks like amulets to ward off age, sickness, unemployment, rain, or death. They buy bottled water, toothpaste, cleaning supplies, and if their kids are old enough, one of the small five cent pieces of candy I've learned to keep next to the register for just this purpose. On those good days, which come once or twice a week, I make just over $400. I walk home at the end of the night feeling better not only my, about my store, but about this country. I think to myself, America is beautiful after all. There is more here. Gas is cheap. This is not a bad place. Things could be worse. And what else could I have done? So then, you hate America today, Kenneth says. He smiles a half smile. He pours a little scotch into a styrofoam cup he stole from his office and hands it to me. I know that if I let him, he would pull from his, from his pocket the missing $26.16 and slide it into the cash register. Anything to make me feel better. With all my heart, I say to him. <laughs>